Okay, now a little birdie has told me that it's not actually Duan. <laughs> so I'm really sorry for pronouncing it like that um, for, for, for the past 20 minutes or whatever. Um, it is actually Duane, which makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna call him Duane from now on. Duane laughed. Oh, all right. Three chocolate sundaes. Hold the cherries. Hudson leaned back and half listened to Duane and Barry talk about the day while he watched the sundaes being made. When the sundaes arrived, Duane and Barry argued over the bill. Hudson noticed neither of his friends asked him to pay. Not that he could have. After he paid his rent and utilities this month, he'd have exactly $123.67 left to buy groceries and pay for bus fare to and from his job. Better pay was a relative thing. He was still poor. If only the Navy had wanted him like it had wanted his friends. Of course, it hasn't. How could he hope to pass a physical? He had two fused discs in his spine, left over from when Lewis threw him against the wall after he mouthed off to him. He had a wrist that gave him fits. It hadn't been set right after Lewis crushed, uh, crushed it under his boot because Hudson wet himself during a thunderstorm, not to mention the nerve injury. He was damaged goods, barely able to walk the spooky halls of Fazbear's Frights. I shouldn't be eating this, Barry said, digging up his spoon into whipped cream. Uh, chocolate syrup and vanilla ice cream. Dinner at my grandparents' house this evening. Chicken fried steak and white gravy, mashed potatoes and creamed corn. Duane, uh, Duane asked, sorry. Uh, what else? Gotta love grandmas, Duane said, spooning ice cream into his mouth. The rich aroma of chocolate cut through the dust and polished smells. You got that right, Barry agreed. Yours does that incredible apple pie, right? Duane nodded, and cinnamon rolls. Thankfully, she only visits a couple times a year. I'd be a tubby if she lived close like yours. How's your granny, Hud? Barry asked. You haven't mentioned her in years. Is she still alive? Hudson nodded and grinned. I don't think she can die. Duane nudged Barry. You remember how afraid you were of her when we, ha when we were kids? Barry held up his hands. Hey, I'm not ashamed. He looked at Hudson. What reasonable person wouldn't be afraid of your granny? <laughs> he laughed. Hudson smiled and nodded. Only an idiot would cross her. Duane grinned. Remember when she made that voodoo doll of Mr. Pike's staff? He laughed. The jerk walked funny for a week, and she only used two pins. Hudson smiled again. His granny was not your run-of-the-mill grandma. That was a good one, he admitted. But I've always thought granny was more wise than scary. She's always known stuff. He thought about how creeped out he'd been feeling at Fazbear's Frights. Like she always told me, that if the hair stands up on, on the back of your neck, you should do what it wants and stay alert because trouble's coming. Duane laughed. So, what's the hair's got... So, what's the... Oh my gosh. So, what's got the hairs on the back of your neck standing up? Hudson looked at him. For real. You want to know? Duane said. For real. Hudson didn't speak. Instead, he thought about his granny an expert in the use of herbs to heal whatever needed healing. Granny Foster was a seer who claimed to know the future, but never bothered to tell anyone else about it. She didn't have any particular faith or belief system, including voodoo, but she thought voodoo dolls were a hoot, and she liked using them to mete out justice to unpleasant people. Why, Granny? Twelve-year-old Hudson asked her once. Why do they work for you? when you don't even believe in voodoo. Granny Foster, who always wore big men's plaid flannel shirts with baggy jeans, rocked in her chair on her front porch and said, I believe in what I believe and because I believe it, it works for me. I don't know what that means, Hudson said. You don't know what to believe. That's why life knocks you around the way it does. Granny Foster had a lot of uh, pithy pronouncements like that and Hudson had spent years thinking about every single one of them. It was one of the reasons he was so edgy at work. Earth to Hud, Duane said. Hudson blinked. Sorry, he took a bite of his ice cream. Okay, what makes my neck hair stand up is Fazbear's frights. Duane laughed. Really? That place? There's nothing hair-raising about it. It's just smoke and mirrors for schmoes and who think being artificially scared is a good idea. Like there isn't enough real scary stuff in life to keep us busy, Barry grunted. Exactly, Duane said. Fazbear's Frights is, a, is just a place to work, it's a job, a short stop along the road. Maybe for you, Hudson sighed. You're not stuck here. 
Dwayne scooped up more ice cream and didn't respond, but Barry said to Dwayne, he has a point. Dwayne shook his head. You can't think that way, Hud. You have to believe things will break for you. Things break all right, Hudson said, thinking about his attempt to date Faith. I mean, break in a good way, Duane said. I know what you mean. Barry and Duane dropped Hudson off at his basement studio apartment four hours before he had to catch the bus to get back on the job. A little drowsy and a lot hungry, Duane put a can of chicken noodle soup on the tiny stove to heat. While he waited for it, he stared at the noodles and thought about his mum, the way she was before Lewis came into their lives, before Hudson's dad had died. She'd never been a particularly warm and fuzzy mum, but she'd been efficient and responsible until her husband was gone. Hudson's dad, Stephen, had been one of those dads every kid wanted, always up for throwing the ball, playing a game or just rough housing. Hudson's dad was fun and attentive. Unfortunately, he also struggled with mental illness for many years. For every happy, high-flying adventure his father had taken him on, there were many more invisible low points that he'd hidden. When Stephen got himself into a bad deal that cost him his small business, and thus his family's livelihood, he'd taken his life. Over the years, Hudson had vac vacillated between loving his dad for the childhood memories they'd shared and hating him for leaving Hudson and his mom alone and destitute, easy prey for a monster like Lewis. Hudson also spent a lot of time asking himself if he was prone to the same bad luck as his dad. Maybe he was, or maybe he just let his dad's fate seal his own. Hudson wasn't sure what had happened, but for some reason after his dad was gone, everything went wrong. It wasn't just about Lewis or about Hudson's weak, checked out mum. It was everything. Suddenly, for instance, he became a target for the worst bullies at school. He was locked into supply closets before class and chased home after the last bell rang. He was pushed, shoved, punched, and almost drowned when his head was held in a flushing toilet. That happened more than once. One of the bullies called him Swirly Head. The teachers at school weren't much better than the bullies. When Hudson's grades started dropping, no one stepped up to help him. No one wanted to know why his grades were going south. They just wanted to yell at him for not keeping up. One, Mr. Atkin, a tough algebra teacher, even called Hudson stupid in front of the class. And the sad thing was that school was the easy part of his life. Home was much, much worse. Lewis had a daily reminder for Hudson. You're nothing. The word nothing was alternated between beatings. You're nothing. Slap. You're less than nothing. Punch. You're smoke. Now, there was some irony, given what eventually happened. Granny Foster liked to say that heat and fire purged, and she was right, sort of. When his family's house burned down at the end of his senior year, it purged Hudson of Lewis and his mother. But it didn't purge his torment. That just worsened. The problem was that the fire investigators concluded the fire wasn't a natural fire. Given Lewis's known violent proclivities, Hudson thought the police would immediately suspect his late stepfather of the crime. Instead, they turned their eyes on the stepson Lewis knocked around. For five years, Hudson had been free of Lewis, his mother and his teachers. But while Duane and Barry had been away at college, he'd gone from one dead-end, boring job to another because he couldn't shake the stigma of being a suspect in an arson or murder. When his friends got back... Oh, hang on. Barry had been away from college, he'd gone on one dead end, boring job to another because he couldn't shake the stigma of being a suspect in an arson slash murder. So I'm assuming there was a fire before and these guys were all like a uh, suspect for it. Huh. When his friends got back, they started taking high paying temporary jobs in construction or whatever, basically just having a good time for a bit before they had to get serious about life. Hudson had been a clerk at a local convenience store for the previous six months until Duane and Barry talked him into applying to Fazbear's Frights. The idea was the three of them would hang out together at Fazbear's for a few weeks and then join the Navy. A fine idea, if Hudson hadn't been battered into worthlessness. Hudson took a deep breath and noticed the smell of something burning. He looked down. The soup broth had boiled away, and now the chicken and noodles were blackened and stuck to the bottom of the pan. Hudson snatched up the pan and threw it in the sink. Smoke filled the air and stung his eyes. How long had he been standing there feeling sorry for himself? He looked at his watch. Too long. Sighing, 
Hudson ran water in the pan and got out a scrub brush. After cleaning up, making a new can of soup and eating, he'd only have three hours to try to sleep before he had, had to get back to work. Virgo was waiting just outside the gift shop when Hudson got back to Fazbear's Frights. Any issues? Hudson asked Virgil. Not unless you call this place's busted thermostat an issue, Virgil said. Hudson shook his head. The building never felt cold to him. You need to get your wife to knit you a thicker sweater. Virgil tugged at the threadbare cardigan he wore. Nah, I like this one. It's comfortable. Hudson nodded and then waved goodbye to Virgil as he shuffled out the front doors. As soon as he was out, Hudson locked the doors, turning to face the building. Uh, Hudson listened to the silence that surrounded him. Weirdly, the silence seemed to move around him like a living, breathing entity. It seemed to have layers, nuances, <laughs> oh god, uh, that is not how you say it, is it? Uh, that contained information he didn't understand. No, not just information, threats. The silence felt like a threat, like a promise of something unpleasant to come. Hudson pressed his back against the closed door and tried to control his quickening breath. He resisted the temptation to un unlock the door and run out into the night. Somewhere in the guts of the building, something thumped. Hudson drew his nightstick. Then he laughed at himself when he felt cool air pouring from the nearest floor vent. The sound he'd heard was just the cooling system cycling on. You need to get a grip, he told himself. He took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Then, keeping his nightstick in his grip, he set out on his rounds. Darkness stretched out ahead of Hudson as he walked in his usual route. The building's lights were set to dim after midnight, causing the boxes stacked in the corridors to cast unusual shadows. Memorabilia that had been unpacked threw shorter, fatter shades that reminded Hudson of the rats in the fake office. When one shadow seemed to shift, he pulled his flashlight and shined a beam on the area, wondering if one of the rats had gotten out of the office. Or maybe they'd brought in more rats. He wouldn't put it past them. After three weeks of keeping an eye on the place while it was being prepared for the public, he was getting used to the rapidly evolving interior. Unfortunately, each room got more unsettling as time passed. The problem was with all the weird characters. Whoever had thought of Freddy Fazbear's characters had a crazy imagination. Who came up with things like a chick with teeth carrying a similarly toothy cupcake? Scott Cawthon. <laughs> Uh, who thought up purple bunnies and foxes with eye patches? And who came up with a black striped marionette mask that was painted like a warrior? Hudson didn't even want to know what the rest of that character looked like. Just the mask hanging over one of the doorways was bad enough. The puppet is in here. <laughs> and of course, Faith and her cohorts had played up every element of Fazbear freaky weirdness. Fake blood was art artfully splashed about cobwebs and dust and scratches had been added to every surface not just on the walls apparently in addition to the coming animations they were going to be adding sound soon very soon hudson had to assume the sounds would be turned off at night but he wasn't sure if that was the case he wondered how he could keep his sanity if he had to listen to fazbear sound effects in addition to seeing the disturbing sights maybe once the boxes were gone it would get better something about those boxes was disconcerting he didn't know what lurked inside of them. What was coming out next? After he'd gotten past the fake office, the janitor's closet and the kitchen, Hudson did a sweep through the dining room and checked the stage, doing his best to stay out of arm's reach of the character statues. He knew that was silly. They were statues, not animatronics. But he couldn't help himself. He just felt like they were going to grab him if he got too close. Hudson checked behind the stage. He noticed more animatronic suit parts had come in. They were scattered across the floor and hanging on the walls. Blood, aka red paint, remember that, he told himself, had been flung across many of the suit parts. Leaving the backstage area, he went down a few of the meandering hallways until he got to Pirate's Cove. Faith had told him that Pirate's Cove was in the dining room in the restaurants, but she wanted to make it a separate space here. I mean, she said, when she was still talking to Hudson. Imagine the fright it will give people when this pirate's hook slashes through the curtain over and over, she giggled. Hudson didn't think it was funny. He was glad Foxy's head, with one eye covered by a black eye patch, was disconnected from the rest of the character suit. He hated to think about a functional character, be it a human wearing a suit or an animatronic, that controlled the lethal-looking hook. 
Leaving Pirate's Cove, Hudson moved on to the fake office. There, he discovered a bin of character parts and props that had been added. He could see the neck of a rock guitar sticking out of the disembodied heads. A loaded trash can had been shoved into the room as well. One of the rats was digging into the garbage. Hudson quickly shut the door and moved on, completing his circuit and ending up back in the lobby under the crumbling brick archway. Hudson looked at his watch. It was only 1.50 a.m. He had over five hours to go before Virgil would come back to, revive, to relieve him for a few hours. Virgil was supposed to come in at seven, along with Barry and Duane, uh, Duane sorry, but he was um, usually late. Hudson tapped his nightstick against his thigh. Time to go to hide in the real office and watch the monitors for a while. Hudson entered the office and put his nightstick back on his belt. He holstered his flashlight and sank into his chair. This room was Hudson's sanctuary. It was the only place in the building where he didn't feel like hundreds of eyes were on him. I got a notification. Um, the only thing in the office that made him nervous was the huge vent cover high on the wall above his desk. A couple of days ago, he decided that someone or something could easily watch him through that louvered cover. So he brought an old blanket from home and tacked it over the vent cover. So far, no one had said anything about it. He wondered if Virgil had ever felt like he was being watched through the vent. Hudson never asked him. Hudson leaned back and put his feet up. He settled in to wait for the night to pass. I feel like there's some subtle foreshadowing there. <laughs> the vent is going to be important. Uh, when Hudson returned from a short break the next day, it was clearly it was nearly noon. Barry and Duane were carrying in another tower of boxes and Faith was sitting on the floor, putting all sorts of new vintage finds from the card cardboard containers. We're breaking for lunch in 15, Duane called to Hus Hudson as Hudson entered the building. Will you be in the office? Sure. Hudson figured he could fit in his starting circuit if in that time if he hurried. Even though he and his friends weren't as close as they used to be, he still found their company comforting. It made him feel just a little less alone in the world. He didn't like to think about what it would be like after they shipped out. He'd missed the camarader camarad oh my god, I can never say this word, camaraderie, <laughs> uh, and the stupid jokes. Duane was always telling really bad dad jokes. What do you call wood when it's scared? Duane asked as he and Barry came into the office at the same moment Hudson was returning from his rounds. Hudson said, I don't know. What? Petrified. Petrified? What do you call a wood? What do you call wood when it's scared? Petrified. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't. I oh god. I don't get it. Petrified. I, no, I don't know. <laughs> you guys are gonna have to tell me in the comments. Am I being really dumb? Petrified. What? Petri Is that like a type of wood? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Duane barked out a laugh. Corny. Barry shook his head. Uh, Hudson chuckled. Barry took out a bag and crossed the room to where a small microwave sat on a shelf. Guess what I bought you guys? Food, Duane asked. Funny. Not just any food. Chicken fried steak with white gravy, mashed potatoes and homemade creamed corn. Will you marry me? Duane asked Barry. Anyone who marries you gets your grandma in the deal, right? Sure, but you're not my type. What is your type? Hudson asked. Not you, Barry, uh, Barry said. All three men laughed. Barry stuck the food in the microwave and turned it on. Immediately, the nearly intoxicating aroma of chicken fried steak filled the room. Hudson realised just how hungry he was. Speaking of marriage, Duane said to Barry, How'd your date with Faith go? Hudson stiffened. Barry went out with Faith? Great, Barry said. Really great. She's pretty amazing. Barry looked down at his hands and then looked at Hudson. She said you two went on a date once, but it didn't work out. Are you okay with me de dating her? I won't if you're not. Hudson shrugged. Sure, I'm okay with it. I'm not dating her. I'd have to be a world-class jerk to say you can't, just because I went on a date with her. What happened? Duane asked. Hudson rolled his eyes. What do you think? Duane and Barry looked at each other. We didn't tell her, Barry said. We don't want to talk to anyone about it. Hudson shrugged. Barry opened the microwave and pulled out the steaming plastic containers. He started parceling out the food on paper plates. <laughs> the paper pals. Uh, 
Hudson was trying not to be mad at his friend, but he didn't think he could bring himself to accept his charity on top of everything. None for me, Hudson said. I'm not hungry. You sure? Barry asked. Hudson nodded. Barry shrugged, but left some food in the containers. I'll leave your share here for when you get hungry later. Through a mouthful of mashed potatoes, Duane added, unless I get to it first. Barry handed Duane a napkin. Close your mouth. Didn't your mama teach you any manners? Hudson looked past his friends and checked the monitors. He noticed the stacks of boxes had grown higher in the lobby. How much more stuff are you two bringing in? He asked. We were told there were a couple more truckfuls coming in, Barry said. Some big fund is arriving tomorrow. Sorry, some big find is arriving tomorrow. What kind of find? Oh, I bet it's Springtrap. I bet it's Springtrap. Uh, Hudson asked. Duane shrugged in response. I don't care about any more finds, Hudson said. When is the phone system being put in? Day after tomorrow, I think. Barry asked. Faith said she wanted to get a couple more projects done before that team came in. Trying not to imagine Faith and Barry together. Hudson shifted his gaze from mon one monitor to the next. He shook his head at all the junk being crammed into the building. What's wrong? Duane asked. Hudson shrugged. He didn't want to get into sharing his feelings with his friends. Whatever you say, Duane said. I didn't say anything, Hudson said. Duane licked his plate. Whatever. You know you look like a dog when you do that, Barry said. Right? I don't care, Duane said. It's good. He put down the clean paper plate and looked at Hudson. What's up with you the last few days? You've been acting weird. Hudson shrugged. When Faith asked me if I did it, it brought it all back, you know. Messed in my head. Barry cringed. That's why I asked if you wanted me not to see her. You like her? Hudson asked. I do. Well, then date her. We'll be gone in a couple of months, Duane pointed out. Barry shrugged. No one can predict the future. Granny can, Hudson said. The men laughed. When his shift break came later in the day, Hudson declined his friend's invitation to dinner. He needed to go see Granny. You need a ride? Barry asked. I'll walk, Hudson said. He decided he wouldn't even try to sleep this evening. He'd visit Granny, get her to feed him, and then see if she had something for boosting his energy. If anyone could keep him awake, it would be Granny. So Hudson left Fazbear's Frights behind at 5pm, and then he strode the ten blocks to his Granny's place. The day was cool but dry. The first of the four leaves skittered along the concrete in front of him as he walked. He inhaled the scent of crab apples, which had fallen from the trees by the sidewalk. Granny had told him scents have power, and when a scent is appealing, inhaling it will give you strength. Don't inhale putrid smells, she warned him once. They're more than just smells, everything is more than it seems. Just shy of the modern apartment building that housed his granny, Hudson caught a scent of something rotting. He covered his mouth with his hand and jogged into the building as some young, hip businessman was coming out. When you thought of a granny like Granny Foster, unconcerned by appearances, who followed the old ways and who used voodoo dolls to handle conflicts, you didn't think of finding that granny in an ultra-modern open loft apartment. When Hudson was a kid, Granny Foster had lived in an old house near where Hudson and his parents lived. By the time of the fire, though, Granny had moved. She said the energy was better downtown, and the place was closer to men. Granny Foster had started dating. Hudson grinned as he took the sleek black elevator up to the sixth floor of the old warehouse that had been converted to lofts. Thinking about Granny Foster dating always cheered him up. Hudson had never met Grandpa Foster. He died before Hudson was born. It was hard to imagine a man strong enough for the likes of Granny Foster, so far, none of her dates had gotten even a semi-permanent position. Hudson stepped off the elevator, listened to the ding as it closed behind him, and strode over a polished cement floor down the far end of the hall. Someone on this floor was baking cookies. They smelled like sugar cookies. He was sure that someone wasn't granny. Her idea of baking didn't result in something as yummy as a cookie. Two steps before Hudson reached granny's door, it opened. Granny was wearing a red and green plaid shirt with her baggy jeans. You're late. Hudson hadn't told her he was coming. He chose to ignore her words. He leaned over to hug her. She smelled like exotic spices and, and, and peaches. He inhaled. Granny Foster's power didn't come from her size. She was only five feet, one inch, and she was as skinny as Hudson was. <laughs> five feet, one inch, two measurements. Uh, <laughs> like if you get it, uh, he'd have been concerned about breaking her when he'd hugged her 
if he hadn't learnt over the years that she had a power that was much stronger than her barely encased bones. Nothing was going to break Granny Foster. A fan of being out in the sun, Granny Foster's skin was dark and thick like cracked leather, and she'd had wrinkles layered on wrinkles uh, for as long as Hudson could remember. She'd also had wild, jaw-length hair that was always in disarray. Her hair was white. It's, apparently her hair had turned white when she was not much older than Hudson was now. He'd never asked her why. Somehow, neither the wrinkles nor the white hair made Granny appear old or weak. Combined with her sharp features and unusually bright blue eyes, they made her look tough, which she was. When he let her go, Granny Foster kicked the door shut and, no and motioned for Hudson to follow her. Instead of leading him to the black leather sofa by the water wall window that looked over downtown, she led him to the centre of the room and pointed. Is that a fire pit? Hudson asked, staring at the small stone walled circle with the burning coals within. Granny waved her hand. Fake, but it will do. Her voice did not match her body. Deep and gravelly, Granny's voice belonged in a trucker's body. It was one of the reasons she was scary. When she spoke, her guttural tones sounded like a demon was controlling her and using her body to speak with to helpless humans. Well, aren't you in a snit? <laughs> oh, God. Um, well, aren't you in a snit? Um, Granny said. Hudson said nothing. He'd learned that speaking as little as possible was the best way to interact with Granny. You had to wait for her to say whatever she was going to say and then go away and try and figure it out later. Sit. She pointed an orange-yellow pillow. Orange-yellow? Orange pillow on the floor by the fire pit. Hudson sat. It's wafting from you like you rolled in excrement, Hudson. You have to let it go. That's my uh, satanic voice. <laughs> How? Leave it. What? The job. Granny dropped her 82-year-old body into an impressive for her age, cross-legged position. Oh, jeez. Um, you need to leave that job, Hudson. Hudson frowned. He thought so too, but he also thought that his thoughts were, were the ravings of an idiot. He was making more money than he'd ever made before. Not that it was enough yet, but it was a step in the right direction. What was he going to do? Go back to making minimum wage and dealing with all the jerks who came into the convenience store? Who treated him like he was a piece of gum stuck to the bottom of their shoes? I can't, Granny, he said. Hmm. Hudson thought about Granny and her predictions. Maybe she knew something. Why should I quit? Hudson asked. What do you know about Fazbear's frights? She squinted at him. All I need to know. She reached out and squeezed his hand. I care about you, Hudson. Quit your job. There she went again, saying nothing substantive. It was just more of her silly voodoo. Hudson shook his head. If I give in, he shook his head again. I can't. Granny sighed. Your path is your own. She held his gaze for several minutes. Then she popped up. Come on. Let's have pizza. I'll call it in. I don't know why it sounds like very like creepy and like threatening. <laughs> Let's have pizza. Um, Hudson grinned. Sure, why not? 